Hello and welcome to round two of Pro Tour Fate Reforged here in Washington, D.C. I am Brian David Marshall. I am joined by Ian Duke, and we are watching Pro Tour champion Tom Martell, the Pro Tour Gate Crash champion, playing. There you get a good look at him. Uh, and he is playing with, against Brad Nelson. Uh, Brad Nelson, of course, the Player of the Year, played in that famous Player of the Year showdown against Guillaume Matignon, two of the games of players, and they are ready to go here in round two. Let's see what they drafted. What, do you, what can you tell me here, Ian Duke, about the archetypes? Yeah, so Brad Nelson's on a white-black deck. It looks to be a little bit more controlling. Actually, he has green as well, so he's full obs on. Okay. Um, he's got two Chief of the Edge, so a small warrior theme. Um, but he's not hyper aggressive. He's got a little bit more of a late game there. Uh, Tom Martell, also on a black green deck, but this time with blue. So he's actually a full Sultai deck. So Sultai versus Abzan. Three swamps from Brad Nelson here. There, there you get a look at uh, a little glimpse at the career of Tom Martell, his 233 lifetime pro points, $130,000 lifetime winnings, facing down a morph creature from Brad Nelson. Yeah, so Brad starting off with a triple swap draw here. This is interesting. This could mean that he's a little bit stuck on colors, Good. or as we saw in the last round with Luis Scott Vargas, he could be sort of feigning color screw a little bit to throw Martell off. Well, you know what? We can take a look. Let's take a look at what is in hand for Brad Nelson. That's a Kintry Warden that's face mm -hmm. down. He has another morph here. So sure enough, he is a little bit stuck on colors, but that doesn't stop him from adding some morphs to the battlefield. Right, probably a Sage Eye Harrier mm -hmm. joining the Kintry Warden. And there is the Lotus Path Jin, a yeah, bird so of prey, preying on morphs and manifests. Yep, yeah, this really highlights, uh, I guess, how well positioned the stats are in the Lotus Path Jin. Uh, as a 2-3, it comes down a turn after the morphs, but threatens to block them. So Rakshasa's Secret is the play from Brad Nelson. Yeah, and it's a little bit awkward for him having to rock shots the secret here um, so early in the game when Martell has some choices over what to discard. Often you want to keep these mind rot cards until, you know, to nail your opponent's last two cards. Um, but Brad doesn't really have any other plays now, so he's just going to go for it. And maybe this enables some delve a little bit down the road. So, no, uh, the irony no green in play for Tom Martell as he discards both Inoc Guide and Map the Waste. Yeah, and he's actually. Not that sad to discard these now. They're cards that lose value a lot in the late game, and he doesn't have the green mana anyway, so. Right, and you see a white and green card get milled away from Brad Nelson. You see a Jeskai student, and you see a uh, Dragon Scale boom. So interestingly, Martell has the Disdainful Stroke here, which uh, he may want to think about holding up um, just in case Brad draws out of his mana screw on the next turn and tries to play a four drop. Martell with a pair of Sultai Soothsayers. Yeah, game. that's going to be a huge game once he gets up to five mana and finds his green yeah, for those. Yeah, and that's going to be plenty of fuel for his Will of the Naga. But rather than hold up the Disdainful Stroke, he adds the um, Monastery Flock to the board, which I agree with because there's no guarantee Brad's even going to draw his fourth mana this turn. And oh, even if he does, you know, you can always hold up the Disdainful Stroke for later in the there's game. There's a Forest, and there's a Grumag Angler. Oh, okay. So well, he does put the Delve to good use from that Rakshasa secret. So and maybe, five, five. Maybe just Tom is wishing he held up that disdainful <laughs> stroke this turn. What do you think? But nevertheless, you know, Tom's still with uh, the Lotus Path Gins to get through in the air. Yeah, it looks like he's a little heavier green than uh, you would see from this opening draw. Mm -hmm. And he picks up an Alpine Grizzly, which is not really going to do him any good here. Um, his options are Will of the Naga, which can sort of tap and freeze two creatures. It's well, sort he of needs the Delve double blue breath. for that, though. Oh, that's Good. right. Yeah, he doesn't even have the double blue. So all he can do is leave up Disdainful Stroke, which, you know, again, he may have wished he had he, last he may, turn He may instead. have missed that window. Yeah, absolutely. Declines to attack with the uh, Lotus Path Jins. Decides it's better to threaten to block two 30. morphs, preventing four damage than to get in for two. But does take five from yeah. the... <laughs> big, big, angler. big hit from the angler. So both players having a little bit of mana trouble here, but it looked like looks like Brad sort of came out of the early game with a little bit of an advantage, largely on the back of being able to stick that angler while Tom's shields were down on the disdainful right. stroke. So w worth noting, Brad really doesn't necessarily need any any white mana to deploy his hand. He's got one card at Chief of the Edge. Uh, oh, and he's got the Anafens of the Foremost also, but he's got other things he can do. There you see a Salt-type Flare. 
uh, joins the tries to join the board, but yeah, gets, gets uh, disdainful stroke. Gets disdainful stroke. Whereas, whereas uh, Tom, Tom desperately needs green to cast three of the five cards in his hand and needs a second blue to cast another. Yeah, but good. instead hits a swamp, which is his fifth land, but doesn't do him a lot of good here since you know he's lacking the colors that he needs. So almost a dead draw for Tom there in some sense. Um, Brad looking to have the better end of the early game here. He's got a douse and gloom in his hand, which he could use on the morph, but there's no real reason to. And as we know at home, yeah. um, that morph is a monastery flock, yeah. so he's not going to be able to take it out. But I, I don't expect Brad to consider that. Angler drops Tom to eight. Yeah, un unmorphs the monastery flock at the end of the turn, just using his mana as efficiently as possible. There's the second blue. So he's going to be able to buy a little bit of time here now with that will of the Naga. Yeah, we'll see if he goes for it now. Um, I suspect he probably will, just because his life total is getting so low, he's going to have to choose between chump blocking or leaving himself susceptible to a larger attack from Brad. You know, if Brad has a removal spell or a trick, he could get through with those morphs. Lotus Path Jin has been holding off two morphs for the entire game, but who knows how long that will last from Tom's perspective. So, decides to get in with the Lotus Path Jin this turn. Probably indicates he's going to be casting Will of the Naga here. Up here. Yeah, he's going to. It is an instant, so he Yeah, he wants to do it on turn. his opponent's turn. Yep. So, you know, Brad doesn't untap this turn and doesn't untap those creatures next turn. Yep. If he did it on his turn, then he would only be skipping and untap this turn. Mm -hmm. So, despite the fact that he could have done it on his turn and gotten a little bit of a prowess bonus. Yeah, still yeah. largely, I mean, this is an uncomfortable sequence of plays for Tom to have to make. By no means a desperation move, but not the way you want to use a card like Will the Naga. I mean, you want to save that to open up an opportunistic attack, not to really sit there and delay. So okay. he's really hoping to find his green mana as soon as possible. No white mana, no fifth mana for Brad Nelson. Brad's holding uh, Reach of Shadows now among his cards. Yep, Nelson just continuing to pick up more cards he can't cast. Yeah. Reach of Shadows and Timely Horde Mate. Good. I'll douse it. Tom adds a morph to the board. Uh, I believe it's a Kintree Warden. Uh, Tom, I, I believe it was a Teamer Charger. Oh, I see. Yeah. There is a Kintree oh, sorry, Warden in play on right. Brad's side of the table. So Brad, uh, Brad uses the first of his arsenal of removal spells and yep. draws up planes. Huge draw for Brad. He's really going to start being able to deploy his hand now. Hits both five mana and his white source Got now. First. <laughs> <laughs> Got there first, says Tom. There's Anafenza the firm foremost. So four, four for three mana. Get a look at it. Yep, and what's great about Anafenza here is that even though she can't attack through the monastery flock successfully, Every time she attacks, she gets to add a plus one, plus one counter to another tapped creature. So, so we'll yeah. slowly get, start get, improving. Get Brad's a morph board. up to a 3-3. Three, three, That's right. Get the angler up to a 6. And importantly, that allows a morph to attack through the Lotus Path gins safely right away. Tom has a lot of untapped mana here, but I don't think Brad really needs to fear it from his perspective because... He knows Tom was stuck on land, so he's just drew into land. And he knows Tom didn't have any tricks earlier in the game, so he he's only drawn land since then, so he probably still doesn't. So sixth land turns on right of the serpent. Declare attackers. For Brad. Trigger. Declare attackers. Uh, gone. Yeah, the Lotus that's Path Jin is there. exiled because of Anafenza. And we get a uh, plus one, plus one counter. Yep, that's yep. it. Tom scoops him up. Shows a reveals morphs at the end of the game. Very Shows him a Sage Eye Harry and a Kintree Warden. Warden. Don't play any spells. That's good enough. So both players having a little bit of mana trouble that game. All right, we're going to be right back with more magic after these quick messages. Outfit your magic collection with the newest Fate Reforged accessories from Ultra Pro. You can see the full array of card sleeves, deck boxes, playmats, and portfolios of your favorite magic artwork at ultrapro.com. Vampires, dragons, beasts, 
Monsters are awesome and so are Magic fans. So we're giving Magic 2015 Duels of the Planeswalkers players the new Master of Monsters card pack as a bonus. Get these 30 new all foil cards added to your digital collection as a bonus starting February 11th. Visit magicthegathering.com now to learn more. All right, welcome back to the feature match area. Brian David Marshall with Ian Duke, and we are going to peek in on a couple players who've been playing this game for quite a while. John Stern versus Pro Tour Hall of Famer John Finkel. Oh, sorry, they're shuffling up. So we're going to go to table C, another Pro Tour Hall of Famer, Shuhei Nakamura, playing against Pro Tour champion David Sharfman. Shuhei Nakamura is up a game, and we're going to pick up the action here in game two. So I believe it's uh, 18 to 20 with uh, Sharfman uh, at the advantage. So he pushes in with a morph, uh, a Dragon Bell Monk, and uh, Mardu Warshrieker. Yeah, but a couple more three color decks here. Sharfman on full Jeskai. And a Sandblast takes down the Hood Assassin. Shuhei on Mardu. I almost forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that looks like uh, Merrick Nightblade. Yep. So he, <laughs> Sharpman's like, oh, I had a sandblast. That, 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 had, uh, that, was, that was death touched. So Shuhei pondering his options here. He yeah. does have access to all of his colors. Yeah, he's down to 12, though. And they keep an eye on the right, upper right hand of your screen. That's the, the match we're going to be returning to as soon as they're ready. Tom Martell versus Brad Nelson. But right now, we're looking in on the former player of the year and yep. Pro Tour champion, David Sharfman. So many things you can say about Shuhei. Player of the year, Pro Tour Hall of Famer. Uh, but Pro Tour champion is not something he has, uh, has done yet in his career. Yeah, absolutely. Mainstay of the Pro Tour, one of the most well-respected players for sure, but still looking to add that title. Yeah, yeah, you know, and you know that, that that keeps him going. So Sharfman coming in here with the, yeah, the War just, Shrieker and Just 25 Grand Prix top eights <laughs> on his resume. <laughs> Blocks with the Mirac Nightblade, but... War Behemoth gets murderous cut. Yep. Shuhei's deck looking to be fairly removal heavy. So no surprise that he's playing a little bit more of a passive game here. Yeah, but he, he falls to nine there, so. Yep. Takes the opportunity to outlast and adds an ankle shanker to the board. A. A defensive. <laughs> <laughs> Non-attacking ankle shankers. Yeah. Not really what that card wants to be doing most of the time, but desperate times. Sharfman's like, ah, oh, okay, what does this mean for me? So it looks like... So are you, are you a little surprised when you said looking in two players, the three colored X, or does this seem surprising to you? It's not hugely surprising, but I, I think with Fate Reforged added to the mix here, uh, players are a little bit more likely to go two colors or very heavy two colors with a splash. Um, so interesting to see, you know, just a couple more decks that have uh, the full three colors playing three color gold cards. Yeah, Martyr Warshrieker attacks, and another Martyr Warshrieker joins the uh, the team. Okay, so sounds like we're ready to go back. Oh wait, thought we were going to be going over to our main table, but it looks like Brad Nelson uh, is taking a mulligan here. So just give you an idea of what's going on in the feature match this round. I said, obviously, Tom Martell and Brad Nelson. The King of the Hill table, Ari Lax, uh, took the King of the Hill uh, last round. And Andrea Mangucci is fighting him for the King of the Hill. If you remember, Andrea Mangucci was really the first guy to like popularize the King of the Hill when he made that incredible run. And I think it was Pro Tour M15. Yeah, I believe so. So yeah, he's actually he's the King of the King of the Hill, so to speak. Yeah, so the <laughs> would-be King. And then of course the the two uh, Hall of Famers, Shuhei Nakamura and John Finkel. Shuhei facing off here against David Sharfman, the Pro Tour champion, and uh, John Stern, the, the opponent for Finkel. John Stern, obviously the the Canadian veteran. Uh, you know, coming off of a, uh, a a pretty impressive run over these last two years at both the Grand Prix circuit and the Pro Tour scene. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Now we're underway here with the match between Tom Martell and Brad Nelson. A Thornward Falls, blue and green mana, leading things off for Tom Martell. Yeah, that bodes a better start this time, as we saw in last game, both players having... And just, and just facing up, <laughs> facing up that team or charger. You know, you know, you have like a lot of ideas about what you could do with that card, but really like beating him for three on turn three. Yeah, I mean, in this is, format, is awesome. two drops are really scarce. Uh, getting a three one down on turn two is just a great start. You know, in many cases, it, it'll get in for three damage and then trade with a morph and you're perfectly happy with that for a two minute investment. Yep, and there, there you go. Sure there enough, Nelson a adds a morph. And uh, Tom is just going to rumble in against it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think he's happy getting up a mana there if they trade, and of course... Well, it's, it's kind of like a check. You're like, well, you know, I want to find out a little bit of information about you, Morph. Are you willing to trade it here, or are you not willing to trade it? Mm -hmm. And then a bit of revelation for Tom Martell. Top yeah, four so cards of his uh, library. This is great for Martell, just ensures he's going to have a smooth draw from here on out, continue hitting his land drops. And and stocks is, you know, puts three cards into his graveyard as well, which for Delve cards is, is going to be great. Yep, great point. You know, if he needs lands, he can take lands. If he needs and spells. So, 92, I'm at 19. Good. Tom drops 19. Brad already at 15 from that team recharge. Brad finds a forest, if he didn't already have one. Go. And adds a Sultai Flare. Oh, there's the Sultai Flare. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a giant stop sign here. Absolutely. For Tom. And Sultai Soothsayer. About one of my favorite cards. Yeah, so last game we saw Tom had two Sultai Soothsayers stuck in his hand. This game, he's able to hit one on turn five. Just a hugely powerful card here, BDM. Uh, has an enter the battlefield trigger that lets you impulse, look at the top four cards, and put one in your hand. But and better than putting those three cards on the bottom of your graveyard in this environment, it puts them into your graveyard. Right, so Tom already has a very well-stocked graveyard here, which is going to let him use his delve cards very efficiently. What, what is, does he have anything really interesting here that we want to see delved? Wow, he dumps a uh, hooting mandrels into the yard. Interesting. So it looks like Tom has a treasure cruise. Aha. Uh -huh. I wonder if that's what we took here. Yeah. Is that... He has the Hooting man Mandrels that we've seen. And the, the Hooting Mandrels look like uh, Brad Nelson kind of st stood up a little bit. Like, oh, wow. That's, that's got to be yeah, some card you took there. Yeah, it's always scary when your opponent discards uh, one mana 4-4. Four, four, and you have to think, <laughs> wow, what do they have in their hand that's so much better than that, you know? Yeah, I feel like we might be going on a cruise next turn. Yeah, this is shaping up to be a pretty long game here. Um, both players having some high toughness creatures in play, kind of stalling up the ground. And, and that's what both of these clans do. Right. Right. Abzan can be very aggressive, but a, a lot of times it's just this this grindy, like, kill your guys, kill shot that, right of the serpent that, and just, like, attrition you, and then eventually have, like, an Abzan guide get you, claw you back into the game when it's the last creature standing. And Abzan generally known for their ability to outlast, of course, but yeah. uh, Tom's deck looks particularly well suited uh, as the Sultai deck to a late game, um, as we've seen his card draw in the form of Bitter Revelation and Treasure Cruise will really help him yeah. as the game goes along. Sultai Flayer attacks. Tom only puts the Soothsayer in the way of it. Yeah, I like that. It's a safe block. I mean, he's perfectly fine. Sure. If and it could just be searching for a raid trigger on something like a Bellowing Saddle Brute. Yep, absolutely. It could be trying to bait out a double block and a removal spell. Or as it turned out, just kind of testing to yeah. see how, how Tom would block. Yeah, and a Rotting Mastodon is the follow-up play for Brad Nelson. Just not enough toughness yet. Needs eight more. <laughs> wow. Is that a Silumgar, the yeah, Drifting Death? Yeah, that is Silumgar. Yeah. So that is a hexproof 3-7 flying oh, yeah. dragon. And whenever a dragon you control attacks, you, as you can read there, creatures defending player controls get minus one, minus one until end of turn. That is huge. Yeah, this is just what Tom needs on this board. Um, as we mentioned before, we've got lots of high toughness creatures gumming up the ground. Brad's got the Sultai Flare threatening to gain more life. Tom adds a hexproof flyer to the board. Yeah, Very hard it, to interact it, it is, with. It is not kill shotable. It so. is not right of the serpentable and many other adjectives. <laughs> so he'll just be able to get in there for three, if nothing else, every turn and sort of put Brad to the test. 
do you have a way to answer this or put some pressure on me? And here it goes. What? It looks like... <laughs> How about a Sage Eye Harrier? So it's a 0-4. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess, a pretty good answer to Silumgar. Holds it off sort of yeah, indefinitely here until Tom can find a way to deal with it. Tom's like, mm-hmm. Of course you do. <laughs> Tom, of course, under no pressure to deal with it quickly. Um, but depending on the shape of his hand, he may want to just try to start clocking Brad. Oh, how about a Sagu Mauler? <laughs> just, just face it up. Yeah, generally a, uh, just a really fearsome card here. One of the top rares from uh, Cons of Tarkir, but uh, with a 2-8 Rotting Mastodon staring it off. Uh, uh, well, did you say 2-2-8 two, two, Rotting <laughs> Mastodons? 2-2-8 two, two, Rotting Mastodons. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like that Sagu Mauler is, is really making headway anytime soon. Brad's deck is very tough to deal with. Very yeah. tough. Almost a futile effort to try to get through on the ground at this point. Um, <laughs> it's not a really easy effort to get through in the air. That's true. And it may mean Tom wants to spend a valuable removal spell on the Sage Eye Harriers if he can if he can find one. And I think he is holding a Reach of Shadows. Let's take a look at his hand here. Hurts. There you go. He is holding Reach of Shadows. He's holding Hunt the Weak. He's got a Disdainful Stroke. And then uh, a Bondkin and a Woolly Loxodon. Yeah. So normally you'd be a little bit hesitant to use a powerful removal spell like Reach of Shadows on a Sage Eye Harriers. After all, it's just a 1-5 creature. It's not really threatening. But with the way this game is shaping up, it's going to be really hard for Martel to get through on the ground. He's got to choose between using multiple removal spells to get through the Mastodons, which looks like he might be doing so here. So he, he, he hunt the weeks uh, on the Mastodon. Uh, with the making a 7-7 seven, seven Sagu Mauler. And now when the Selimgar attacks, that It'll finish that off the Mastodon that's been weakened already, as well as shrinking the other Mastodon and making it hard to block the Sagu Mauler. So I actually really like this play. Very clever on Tom's part. And it may mean he's getting in for 7 here with the Sagu Mauler. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. goes to 8. So Sage Eye Harrier and Silumgar continue to bouncing off e bounce off each other, but now uh, with the Silumgar combined with the 7-7 seven, seven, uh, Sagu Mauler, he's able to attack each turn for seven until Turns. Brad adds something Three. else to the board. Rock Shasta secret for Brad Nelson. Tom has to decide which of his cards he's got. He's got four of them. Which two does he want to discard? Yeah, unfortunately for Tom, they're all relatively powerful, impactful cards. Probably we'll see him drop the Krumar Bonkin, which he does. And, 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 and the Woolly Loxodon. And the Woolly Loxodon. Yeah. Okay, so just kind of giving up on attacking with no, no, big ground he, creatures he, at this point, which I agree with. Okay. Martel holding back a Disdainful Stroke and Reach of wow. Shadows. Oh, okay. wow. Okay, Brad just packs him up. Brad's like, yeah, that's, that's not what I want to be doing. And Tom Martel evens the matchup, one game apiece. Uh, you know, going around the tables, we know our Andrea Mangucci's up one game over Ari Lax, Shuhei one game over David Sharfman, and do we know what's going on in the John Finkel, John Stern match? Okay, we're gonna take a live look in here while we wait for those guys to get ready to game three. We won't, we won't miss a turn of game three here, though. Okay, we're gonna look in on John Stern and John Finkel. So John Finkel piloting um, an Abzan deck here. Looks to be base, black, green. And there you get a look at the life totals. Stern, seven. John is at five, I believe, actually. There you go. At, and uh, what game is this? Do we know? Stern, Stern is up one game to zero here. Getting word from our sideline reporter, Rashad Miller. John and Stern piloting a... Just white and black deck. Uh, smite. And here we see a Smite the Monstrous taking down. Can't quite see what that creature was from here. Leaving John Finkel with just a Whisper <laughs> of the Wilds. Yeah, and he has to pass the turn. Shambling Attendance is the uh, is the creature for, for John Stern. Attack base. 
Three. Yep. John goes down to two. Finkel looking to be out of gas here. He doesn't have access to his white mana, but he also doesn't have very many white cards. Oh, in his deck. and Ruthless Ripper oh, reveal shambling him off. attendant. Wow. Finish you off with the losing two life. John Stern wins two games to zero over John Finkel. He advances to 2 0. And uh, there you get a look at your feature match area. R Rashad Miller walking over to the match between and Ari Lax and Andrea Mangucci, and those ga ga guys are tied up one game apiece, actually. So we are picking this up in game three. We're going to take a peek here at what's going on. There you see Ari Lax, your king of the hill, your reigning Pro Tour champion, uh, Outlast, a disowned ancestor, playing an unyielding Krumar, and uh, Andrea Mangucci has a Gore Swine, an Alabaster Kieran, and a Bloodfire Expert in play. And it looks like he looks to be red-white. Maybe, uh, oh no, I see, I see, I see. So he's Mardu. I do see uh, a Sadisi's pet up there. It looks like, ooh, it looks like he has a High Sentinels yes. of Ration in his deck. Uh, Ari Lax uh, looking to be in the better position on board right now. Huh. Of course, these uh, red base red-white decks tend to be pretty aggressive, and Ari looks like he's assembled a pretty good ground defense here with some high toughness creatures. Um, he's got the Sagu Archers to hold off the Alabaster Kirin. Pyro? Oh, Pyrotechnics. <laughs> Finish, you know, not the most spectacular Pyrotechnics. Just a one for one, but it also gets a little bonus point of damage in on Ari Lax. And Ari, of course, keeping okay. up with his trademark chatter where he's guessing what uh, Minguchi's going to play, guesses correctly at the Pyrotechnics. Okay, continues to outlast the disowned ancestor. Oh, a kill shot for the Alabaster, Kieran. Sort of undoes the work that Minguchi set up there, trying to clear the path with the Pyrotechnics. And the full retail War Behemoth. Yeah, this is a tricky board for Minguchi to get through here. He's got the uh, Unyielding Crew Mar threatening to gain first strike. There's a Tusk Guard Captain. The Arashian Cleric <laughs> gains three life for Andrea Mangucci. Puts a little speed bump in front of the red zone. Yeah, probably not what Mangucci's hoping for <laughs> on this board state here. And what turn is he hoping for that on? Turn two? Yeah, I suppose so. It, it's a little, it looks, his deck looks a little conflicted here. On the one hand, he's got Gore Swine here. He <laughs> Gore clearly Swine. wants to be aggressive, but then he's also got uh, a 1 3 that's gaining him life. So. Okay, Outlast. The Tusk Guard Captain and face up an Obzon Guide. Yeah, and this is really not what Minguchi wants to see. Huge life linker. Uh, can't attack through the Gore Swine yet, but. Um, but, you know, if it attacks, you, you expect that your opponent probably has a trick. Like, Absolutely. Here. <laughs> Ari Lax, talk about Trumpet Blast and Barrage of Boulders, which would be. Pretty much lethal. That would be lethal for Andrea Mangucci while uh, Ari's man is de tapped down. But it looks like no such luck for Mangucci as he ponders the turn. <laughs> yeah, it, lo it looks like a couple lands there. You know, sometimes Trumpet Blast and Teamer Battle Rage can do it. Yeah, as we saw in. Uh, the earlier game with uh, Teamer Battle Rage. I'll let you know when I've officially... So uh, Andrea is attacking. He sends in the War Behemoth. He sends in the Bloodfire Expert. So can't just... Can't just have lane. It sounds like while we're, while we're watching this, uh, Brad Nelson is going to be starting, he hopes at this point, game three of his match with Tom Martell with... Only five cards. He's mulliganed twice. So a pretty clever attack there by Minguchi, taking the opportunity while um, Ari Lax was tapped out and okay. can't activate first strike on his Krumar. 
he at least gets to trade the Bloodfire Expert for a creature there. And Ari Lax just willingly trading off the Obzon Guide for the Gore Swine, which not normally a great trade that you want to make, but I think Ari's really valuing the extra life points that he gains here, um, just to preclude Minguchi from being able to do something like Barrage of Boulders plus Trumpet Blast, right. as you mentioned or, before. Or War Flare. Yep. Or yeah, any number of cards. I think he realizes against this red-white deck, if he doesn't lose right away, then he'll win the long okay, game. Okay, we're, we're, we're back here at our main table. Brad Nelson, of course, starting on five cards, goes... Swamp, Plains, Forest, Morph, and oh, look at, look at, look at Tom. Did Tom go Forest, Swamp, Island? How lucky these yeah, two the guys. Yeah, the natural Tron, as we yeah. call it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we call it the full Mikey P after oh, sure. Pro Tour champion Mike Pistolik. There's Tom Martell. You get a look at his stats. Two Pro Tour top eights, six Grand Prix top eights. The win. Adds a 3-3 manifest to the board. Take a look at uh, Tom Martell taking uh, the opportunity to cast Bitter Revelation. Yeah, the, after the morphs traded, he he's got no, uh, you know, not under a tremendous amount of pressure from that morph. Yeah, he knows Brad's... Manifest, I should say, sorry. Brad started down cards this game, so he's unlikely to have an extremely aggressive curve out start. Uh, so just taking his time to set up with the Bitter Revelation. Looks like he was a little bit uh, flooded before casting the Revelation. Four more lands how, in hand. How, how do you feel about Formless Nurturing, the card that uh, Brad played to make that Manifest creature? I think it's a card you're not super happy playing, but it's a fine filler type card. Okay, there, there are two of them uh, in Brad's deck, mm -hmm. and he follows up with a Saltai Scavenger. And it's one of the nice things about Manifest is also is those cards go into your graveyard. You get a creature, but you also get a card in your yard, which helps you with delve. There's a really nice synergy between those two mechanics. Absolutely, yeah. There's a number of small synergies like that between the mechanics in uh, Concert Tarkir and Fate Reforge that, that they're really pleasing when they come up in ways like that. And they, there you see Tom's hand, an Ice Feather Aven, a Salt High Soothsayer, Hooting Mandrels, Disdainful Stroke, a Reach of Shadows. So a really powerful hand if uh, if Tom has time to deploy all these things. What, but, what's your play here? Um, yeah, I think I think you just have to go for the soothsayer. I mean, Tom has uh, just a lot of card draw in his hand. It's a little bit clunky. He just wants to kind of play those cards early to increase his options, and then he can kind of shift gears and get more efficient going forward there. The other great thing about the Soothsayer is, of course, it blocks the 3-3 Manifest. And Tom just reasoning, I have enough time to cast these card draw spells now. Let me do that first, and then I can sort of catch up on the board right. later on. He knows he has an answer for that 3-3 in the air. Mm -hmm. Although, Brad having a pretty decent start here for, for what, a five-card hand he's Yeah, on? and you know what? Brad just draw land. He's going to be able to... Uh, Reach of Shadows, that Saltai Soothsayer, and get in for yeah. six here. Chooses to play the Chief instead, though, and get in for four in the air. So th that's good discipline on Brad's part. I mean, I think a lot of players here would just say, hey, I started on five cards. My only chance to win this game is just to come out strong and aggressive. Um, I'll just kill that creature and get in for more damage. But he realizes that Martell's drawn so many cards by now, the chances of him just steamrolling over Martell are, are so low at this point that he's going to just hang in there and be a little bit more stingy with his removal. I like that, to be honest. One card for Brad. 19 in hand for Tom Martell. It's certainly what it's got to feel like <laughs> yep. from Brad's perspective. Yeah, it's got to be demoralizing in his position. But, you know, Brad is ahead on board now, and Tom's all the way down to 11, so it's definitely anyone's game. Um, so Reach of Shadows takes down the flyer. Yep. And Hooting Mandrels comes down for just a green man. Wow. That is powerful. So, yeah, huge turn from Tom here. Um, there was a risk that turn if Tom had just sort of played one big threat and passed the turn back that uh, Brad Nelson could Reach of Shadows, whatever Tom played, and still continue pressuring him on the board. But Tom, with two really powerful, impactful How plays in the same turn, it's like going to be hard for Brad to... Uh, to match that. I'll save me the time of trying to figure out. Go ahead. <laughs> Best represent that I might have opened here. So on the back table, it sounds like we have a new king of the hill. 
It's our old king of the hill, Andrea Mangucci. All right. He's ba he loved being there. I don't think he's going to want to let go of that seat. I wouldn't if I were him. <laughs> yeah. You have a lot more playing. You have a lot more room to play in the feature match area than you do out on the floor, too. <laughs> the perks. It sounds like we have another result. This is our last match going right now. Shuhei Nakamura won over David Sharfman. I believe two games to zero. I was two to one. Get there. They, Sharfman did pick up a game when we weren't looking. So this is the last match. It's in game three right now. Tom Martell, here, here he is. So Brad with no plays on his previous turn just kind of shrugs the shoulders and ships it back to Tom, uh, leaving up five mana for Reach of Shadows. We'll see what Tom does on his turn. Plays the Lotus Path Jin. Yep. Good. It says go. Patience here from him. Look, I mean, he's still got. He's, he's sitting on that. He's sitting on that disdain. Full stroke. Yep. Doesn't really have any great attacks there, nor any real reason to attack at this point. Right. I mean, Brad's basically out of cards. He's got a disdainful stroke for Brad's next big play. Uh, so Tom just kind of playing it patiently, adding one threat to the board at a time, and holding up his counter magic. Right. Has that ice feather even to sort of, you know, mess up Brad's math a little later on. Right. So, and or, or just sort of has two chances to make sure Brad doesn't th slip through a big threat between the disdainful stroke and the ice feather even to bounce something back to Brad's hand. He's in a pretty comfortable position here. Here's Anna Fenzo, the foremost. That gets in four points of power under the disdainful stroke at three mana. Yeah, and we may see Brad try to set up a turn where he's able to reach of shadows a blocker and attack with the Anna Fenza just to start getting plus one plus one counters on his creatures and start start getting some pressure back on Tom. But of course, as we know, Tom's ready with that disdainful stroke. And Tom being the patient player that he is, I don't think he's going to um, put his shields down and allow Brad to get off that reach of shadows. Uh, over the years of getting to watch these two players play, uh, both of them are incredibly patient. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people will talk about what you know. What's the biggest difference between you know someone playing Friday Night Magic and people playing on the Pro Tour? And I think if you watch these two guys in action, you'll get a sense of that. Just like the 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 timing with which they'll how 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 long they'll wait on their cards and how much they'll value their removal. Yep, and we we have seen Brad do just that this game. He has that opportunities to cast that Reach of Shadows, but declined to do so. Um, just waiting comes the for Lotus it. Path Jin. Here's a morph. We know that that's an Ice Good. Feather Raven. I assume that's the ice for the Raven anyway. And this could be a big turn for Tom because he's left four mana up, which is just enough to disdainful stroke Brad's play and turn the ice feather. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken there. Uh, he would need three more mana to turn You've the You've been ice manifesting feather. your ice that's feather right. Ravens, that's haven't right. you? That's yep. right. <laughs> which is a sweet feeling, by the way. Brad Nelson had a, a healthy 18 life here. So we'll see if Brad decides to pull the trigger on the Reach of Shadows. Three for four, for four cards. I mean, from his perspective, it's, if it's successful, it will allow him to attack with uh, some creatures here, potentially. Don't, does, is not going to want to risk an attack and then Reach of Shadows. It's going to be right. Reach of Shadows first, see what happens. Oh, it looks like Martell actually picked up a second Disdainful Stroke. Oh. Wow. So he's sort of got Brad's next two big plays covered, which is a uh, really good spot to be in. And Brad seems to know what's going on here. He's got his, he's got his head in his hand. He's like, ah, oh, just go. Go. I'm curious about that Map the Wastes in uh, Tom's deck. Yeah, not, not 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 a card that uh, has rated very highly on the limited set reviews I've listened to. Yeah, not a super high pick card, but you know it's mana fixing is mana fixing, and um, Martell's deck looks to be both slow but also capable of defending itself right. well. So. Have, haven't seen a ton of game lands from him exactly. I think we've seen one Thornwood Falls. He may have more. Yeah, and have another morph from Tom. Two. That's a Krumar Bonkin. One of those morphs is much better than the other. And Tom Martell just pecking away with the Lotus Eye gins there. Yeah, and now he can't, now Tom has the mana to both Ice Feather Aven and Disdainful Stroke. Yep. That's right. All right. 
four mana for an Obzon Battle Priest. And that's good. That's going to get a disdainful stroke out of Tom's hand. So from Brad's perspective, it may look like, okay, great, I've cleared the way. Maybe next turn I can cast my Reach of Shadows. But as we know, uh, Martell has the second disdainful stroke. And considers at the end of the turn maybe turning up that Ice Feather Aven and bouncing something back to Brad's hand. Now, the, the risk here on bouncing the Manifest creature, even though it's a 3-3, three, three, is that it could be a spell. Yeah, it could be anything. It could be, you could it be, could be an Ugin. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, we know. We know what it is. It's a dragon scale boon. Yep. Tom considers his, his unmorphs, says, nah, that's fine. I'm happy where I'm at. Yeah, I like that play. There's, I mean, really no reason for Tom to act there. It's just he can feel so safe keeping that Ice Feather Aven face down. He's got plenty of mana, so he doesn't have to worry about um, sort of committing his lands to that possibility. And a Rakshasa's secret to clear Brad Nelson's hand. Been sitting on that Reach of Shadows forever. We know it wasn't going to resolve, but he doesn't. And he now is empty-handed. Wow. Saga Mauler goes to the yard from the mill effect the self-mill effect of the Raksasha secret. That Saga Muller's gone, by the way. Oh, Saga Muller's gone. Brad reminds him. Onofenza's ability. If anyone who's played Commander with Onofenza versus Sidisi knows. <laughs> <laughs> Mortal those. enemies. Yeah, they really are. It's, it's pretty lopsided in favor of uh, Onofenza. And Tom is going to turn some creatures sideways. Yep. Tom's still playing carefully the, here, even though he's empties, emptied Brad's hand. As we mentioned before, two patient players. So in comes the Hooting Mandrels, in comes the Lotus Path Jin. What are you going to put in the way here? You have no cards. <laughs> you have no cards. Decides to put the two. And here comes Ice Feather Aven. Ice Feather Aven blocks, uh, bounces. Wow. He wants the, he'd love to bounce the manifest, get a little information, but he's worried. What if it's an amazing card? Yep. I'll bounce the chief. Yeah, he bounces the chief and eats the manifest Third creature. One. Sees a 3 3 Three dragon one. scale boon go to the graveyard. No. It's kind of ironic no. to have a dragon scale boon with a plus one, plus one counter on it. Two. Yeah, rough spot for Brad here. Game three of the match. Back up against the wall. It's just looking a little bit dejected here. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's put up a pretty valiant showing yeah. considering he started this game on five cards on the play. Yeah, I think he played the game very well, you know, was very patient. But uh, Tom just in a landslide of card advantage and careful play himself, just tightening the vice. Yeah. Yeah, he's sending everybody but the soothsayer. Shots the secret was just sweet, just like completely leaves Brad with, you know, you, you know, once you get your opponent's hand empty, you feel so good. Yeah, we've seen this card be actually pretty great today so far. Um, in our, our first feature match, Luis Scott Vargas versus Sam Party, uh, Party used it to take out LSV's uh, Icy Blast. Earlier in this match, we saw um, Brad use it to set up an early Gurmag Angler. Yeah. And then in this game, we saw Martell empty out uh, Brad's hand, including, including the critical removal spell. So, Anafenza steps in front of the Hooting Mandrels. Krumar Bonkin reveals himself to be the mystery guest. And uh, Brad takes nine here. And, yep, that's still gone. Exiled because of Anafenza's ability. Brad Nelson extends the hand. Tom Martell wins two games to one and takes the match. So just to recap what happened this round, uh, Pro Tour champion Tom Martell defeated former player of the year Brad Nelson two games to one on our feature match table. On the King of the Hill table, Andrea Mangucci uh, defeated Pro Tour champion Ari Lax two games to one. Uh, Shuhei Nakamura, the Pro Tour Hall of Famer, defeated Pro Tour champion David Sharfman two games to one. And on our back table, the Battle of the Johns from the 1990s, <laughs> John Stern 
defeats Pro Tour Hall of Famer John Finkel two games to zero. Um, yeah, welcome back to the booth, Brian David Marshall here with Ian Duke. That was that was some uh, exciting matches yeah, we've seen so been far. Great matches so far, really, really interesting. And again, fast, you know, Rakshas the secret, pretty exciting. I can't wait to draft some tonight. But in the meantime, we're going to send it back to the news desk and our own Rich Hagon. All right, thank you very much indeed to Brian David Marshall and Ian Duke down there, Tom Martell and Brad Nelson going at it at the back end of round two. Time has been called and the matches are ticking down. There's only five or so to go. So the way the math works, there are around about 200 players at 1-0 and 100 players-ish, a little less than that, on 2-0. Nonetheless, here are some of the players who've started out well at 2-0. You have former world champion from 2010 from Chiba, Guillaume Matignon of France. He has a very interesting deck choice for modern as well. Dennis Rashid of Sweden with his two Pro Tour top eights in a year, a couple of years back, he is at 2-0. Also, Alexa Talarov, uh, a regular at the World Magic Cup, but now starting to deliver on the individual Pro Tour scene. He was the Serbian captain in Nice. Reed Duke, your number five ranked player in the world is 2-0, as is Hall of Famer from Japan, Kenji Samura. Neil Oliver, the winner of the world's largest ever Magic event, which will still be true until the next Grand Prix Las Vegas for Modern Masters, of course, at the back end of May. He's 2-0. Jelga Vigesma of the Netherlands, Hall of Famer 2-0. Eric Froelich is up to 2-0, the winner of the Grand Prix from last week, alongside Paul Chion and Luis Scott Vargas. Paul Chion, who got in the last competitor to make it into this field, he has started out 2-0. And, oh. and then Luis Scott Vargas, he is 2-0. So all three of last week's winning Grand Prix team are now a combined 6-0 after two rounds. Your number two ranked player in the world, even Flock, is 2-0. Stephen Murray of Scotland defeated Andrew Devine of England, a little local match there, uh, to go to 2-0. Devine at 1-1. Neil Rigby is 2-0 for England. Paul Rietzel, 2-0. Zvin Moshevitz, the Hall of Famer. And Ray Perez Jr., Jr. your reigning Rookie of the Year, is 2-0 and O. Oh. But that gives you a guide to what's going on uh, in the field here on day one. Second round is almost in the books, but we have a chance now to go deep inside the draft. All the picks that matter waiting at the video wall is Marshall Sutcliffe and our special guest, Sam Pardee.